Today, we're going to talk about mechanics, and that could mean a lot of things as far as positioning on the floor, primary coverage areas, double whistles, you know, what do we do in certain situations? I'm going to, I'm going to try and come up with a few different things. If you have any questions along the way, obviously ask if you have any comments to make or see that I'm wrong and what I'm showing by all means, tell me, uh, cause that's what we're here for, right? To, to talk. So, um, I'm going to try not to show any videos I've shown in the past, but no guarantees on that. I forget sometimes what I show. Let's play it first, and then let's talk about what happened. Shockey wants it. That, they certainly have to get them more involved if they want to win this one. Shockey driving, nearly stolen. Shockey going into the defense. Great finish. By okay, no whistle on the play. I'm going to go back. I'm going to play it fast again. He wants it. That, they certainly have to get them more and involved. And I'm just if they curious. Want to win this one. Shockey driving, nearly stolen. Shockey watching the video the from this Great angle. Finish by what do we think? Foul or no foul? Is that a no call? What do you all think? I mean, I don't think it was a bad no call. I mean, you definitely could have called a foul as the guy went up. He Right. So he goes up, jumps into his player, right? Does he not jump into the player? And in my opinion, the ball handler does a great job knowing he's getting fouled and goes up with the shot. Of course, he didn't get the call here. But I think that's a foul. I think we need to blow our whistle on that. So where should this whistle have come from? Now, down on the end line, you see the lead. And he is actually table side, even though it looks like he's starting to maybe come over and then decides not to. And then you've got the center who's right at the bottom of the screen and then trails out of the screen. So I'm pretty sure trail is, <laughs> doesn't need to make this call unless someone else thinks differently. Trail's got to look through too many players. Trail's too far away. It's not even close to his area. So trail's off the hook. But can the center or the lead take this? Center had the best shot of that, right? And then, uh, I mean, it would not have been a far reach if, if uh, lead had taken it. But Right. So whose primary is it? Center. As you As you can see, it's centers, right? Not even close to leads. I'm not saying lead can't come get it, but it's not even close to leads. This is center all the way, not to mention it started all the way in center, right? Started center, still in center. The play's ending at center where it's developing and then he's going up. The center is, has watched this play from beginning to develop to end. He's got a pretty good view. I know 40 is kind of in his way, but for the most part, He's unobstructed. He sees the whole play and he saw it from beginning to end. Center's got to get this call. Yep. Totally. Lead. All center. Now the lead is looking at it. He's obstructed by this guy here, but if the lead sees it and wants to come get it, I'm okay with that. But this is totally the center's call all the way. Does everybody agree with that? I do. Again, doesn't mean lead can't come over and help. But the primary responsibility, that has got to be gotten by the center. Anything to add? All right, so that was a, as far as coverage area. And Josh, one question. Yeah. Um, I know you talked about it quite extensively about traveling on Sunday's uh, level two clinic. Uh, does anybody see a little uh, hop in there after... He lands and then re-gathers himself before it. shooting. They certainly have to get him more involved if they want to win this one. Shockey driving, nearly stolen Shockey. All right. Now, this is a good point, John. Great and I did talk by. about this at a clinic on Sunday. And I want to make mention of this because – let's just go back on the he screen finished, Mark. Yeah. All right. So he's got the ball. Maybe – I think he catches it while he's in the air. He might even catch it after he's down on the ground. And John, you're saying that really little hop at the end before he puts it up. That's what, that's what I, that one right there. Yes. Right there. All right. So again, it's, it's, you know, it's such a, it's going to happen such a bang, bang and it's hard to you know, see how much did he really, and does it really matter? Okay. So what I talked about on Sunday and I'm a big believer in this and it's a little bit higher level. It's not, you know, 
oh, only the best guys can get it. It's just not beginning level thought. So if you're a brand new guy or within the first couple of years, and this is a little over your head, don't worry about it. But not just travels, any call, any foul or violation, we as officials need to allow some leeway. We have to allow little, little bits of, well, he kind of traveled or he kind of moved. You know, when you drag your foot slightly, you're dribbling in and you stop and you drag your foot slightly. Is that really violating the intent of the rule? Or is his momentum kind of taking him? That little hop at the end, did he make a huge jump, which put him at a big disadvantage or, or put this player at a disadvantage? Or was it kind of a, he's stopping and, and making an extra move? In my opinion, a move like that, John, we need to give a little leeway to, unless it's a big one and grandma up in the, you know, upper stand sees it, we could probably pass on that. If you think he gains an advantage by doing that, absolutely get it. But if it's just kind of natural movement um, of a player, I think we need to have a little more tolerance of things like that. That's me personally. Well, it's a, a few guys that think that, but. No, I, I agree with uh, giving you a little latitude um, in those type of situations. The other thing was, and maybe this is a pregame thing, you know, as a, as a, as a crew, you know, when you're the lead, you know, who's, are you going to watch the upper body waist up and the center or trail is going to watch below the waist or, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Okay. So, and I don't like mean to digress from whatever you want to call cop cover today. No, no, no. That this is all part of mechanics. This is all part of what should we be doing? The lead. Now, again, some of this is generalization of what I say. Nothing should be all or nothing, right? There's always going to be in between. But generally speaking, if you are watching the ball, not lead, center, or trail, if you are the official in your primary coverage area and you are watching the ball, you need to watch the body. Well, in my opinion, you need to see the whole thing. But primarily, you need to see from feet to head. Okay, from feet to head, you need to see that because that's where most contact is going to happen. When there's a play where they start to go up and it's in this area where it is now and you're both kind of equally to it and the lead kind of has a good look and the center has a good look, the lead is almost always going to be looking at the body contact, almost always, because the lead can't look up because then what's he looking through? There's... He's looking through, well, not just through the players, but now he's got all the basket and the, and the rim and all that stuff up there. He's got to stay down low because he has obstructed view up top where the trail in the center, when they're further out, there's nothing obstructing their view from up top. Now that's not to say these kids jump so high that it's in the way, but generally speaking, they're going to see from the ceiling down to say the shoulders or the waist. Now, again, if it's your primary coverage area, I honestly expect you to see from the feet to the ball, to the head. If it goes all the way up, you need to see it all. You need to get in a position to see it all. But generally speaking, yes, John, lead is down low, trail and center are up high. Does that answer kind of what you were you were asking or, or yes. suggesting? Yes, it does. And that way you can kind of be sure that you've shared – the responsibility of that player, right? Mm -hmm. I can't stress enough though. And I've already said it three times. If it's your primary, you need to see the whole player, right? Because it's your primary. You need to know what's going on. All right. Let's go to the next one. All right, this is an out-of-bounds play. Ball goes out of bounds. They throw it back in for a throw-in. What could Josh possibly be showing on this? Can anyone tell me what I'm showing on this? I think Trail should be administering the throw-in. Trail should be administering the throw-in. Trail got the call. It's his line. Perfect. 
He should get this call. That's his line, right? But the rules book in a three-person game is clear. And they say, whose ever line, I'm paraphrasing, whose ever line's responsibility it is, it's their responsibility to administer the throw-in. So just because it's super far away shouldn't give the, the trail the you know, leeway to say, well, you take it because it's closer. And I know they do this at the college level. I don't know if it's the men or the women's. And I know we can do it at the two-person level. If it's two-person, then we can share that. Um, and I believe the free throw line across to uh, down to the end line is the lead's responsibility. But that's because there's only two men on that game or two people, right? So in a two-person game, you have to be able to share more. In a three-person game, there is absolutely no reason for the lead to take that. And all that the trail has to do is come in as this shows and bounce it to the player as he, he could even be backing out. And you just tell the player, hey, I'm going to bounce it to you. Now they know they're gonna, you're going to bounce it. They're not going to walk up towards you to be close to you. Stay there. I'm going to bounce it to you. And then walk back out so you're in position, so you can see all the players. All right, but for throw-ins, if, if it's your line, you made the call, then you make the throw-in. Does everybody understand that? That's an easy concept, right? Let's not get lazy and pass it off, and let's not say, well, you've got a better position, and so that can come out. We can all, You can bounce it far. You can bounce it and back out. There might be, you know, again, I never say everything is ever, uh, all or nothing, but almost always, that's the way it's going to be. There might be a situation where it's okay. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'm sure someone would come up with a situation where it might be okay. But for the most part, your line, you take it. Good? All right. Moving right along. Let's play this one. All right, double whistle, double whistle. I'm not worried about the foul. Was it a foul? Was it not a foul? I don't care about that. There was a foul and there was two whistles that called the foul. So hopefully it was a foul. But what's important about this and a double whistle? We have a double whistle. And did you see uh, the official who reported it was the trail, correct? I know it cuts off right before, but he's going to report. But whose area is it? Looks like he fouled them to me. So they got the call right and they were both watching, which is fine. The, the, the trail uh, doesn't have much to look at. So I'm okay that there's a double whistle here. But who's, whose area is it? Right? It's in the leads area. I mean, and it's right in the middle of the leads area. So we as officials, and I'm okay again with double whistles. I'm okay with double whistles in almost every situation that I see them. But we need to know when there is a double whistle, whose area is it? And that official takes the call. Unless that official, and this could have happened in this game, has had three calls in a row, four calls in a row, and they want to share, you know, the wealth because otherwise it looks like they're calling the whole game. I get that. Then they they pass it off and let their partner take it. But outside of that, if the call is in your area, you call it, you report it. Don't say it's a double whistle so you can have it and then, you know, bail. And I think they did it more, in my opinion, because, all right, you're right there, right? You step out and you report it. Now it's less steps that you have to take. Well, that's, let's not be lazy and let's take what is in our area. Do you all understand what I'm saying? All right. Anything to add on that video? Hopefully these are relatively basic uh, concepts, but unfortunately, as basic as they may be, guys still aren't doing it. So that's why we're covering it. Here's another double whistle. Um, 
Same scenario. I'm going to play it fast again, but same scenario, double whistle. Whose area is it? The transition. And the transition's coming into the front court. And I would say the foul happens relatively close to a transition of areas. Even though in transition, there's not necessarily a there's not necessarily a um, primary coverage area. Um, once we get into the front court, for the most part, we can assume that PCA. But the lead, who the play is coming to, is 20 feet away, right? And the trail, who came running in to get it, is 40 to 50 feet away. So who do you think we should believe got the call right more than the other? Who are you going to believe? Lead. lead. The lead. And it's great. I, I'm going to give the, the, the trail credit here. The trail came running in. The trail made sure that they were right on top of where the foul happened. So it looked like they got it. They're coming in. And that's great. That's really, really good. But your partner was also right there. And I'm okay that there was a double whistle because it was in transition, right? But your partner's 20 feet away. Let your partner take it. I think it's going to look better. If your partner, who the play is coming to and who is closer, gets it, then the guy who comes running in from way behind. Agreed? Yes. So most of this so far, what we're talking about is when you make calls, know where the call is. Know where the foul or the violation happens. That way you know which official is in control or should be in control of making that call. Doesn't mean you're right. Doesn't mean you're wrong. Doesn't mean you're you're a weak partner trying to or a strong partner trying to help out a weak partner. It just means you have to be aware of what your area is. If you are aware of your primary coverage area, you're going to be way better off when the when the fouls or the the controversy maybe gets hard. And a block charge, right? A blarge. When we see those, why do blarges happen? Double whistle, and guys aren't aware of where the foul happened, and they both signal. Right. So if you're aware that it wasn't your area, but you blew your whistle, chances are not a hundred percent, but chances are good that you're not going to have those kind of uh, double foul type situations. All right. Any comments to that one? All right. This one, we're going to talk about positioning. Anybody see anything about that play worth talking about? Center's out of position. The center is out of position. I agree, but he but it's the trails area. The trails watching the play. The trail is looking right in between the players. That's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Then the ball comes down and the trail moves down with the ball, right? But what does he do to himself? He comes down too far as trail and yeah, maybe he can kind of see in through the side there, but he's for the most part now straight lining himself with those two players. If he were to stay back where he was, right. He could yeah. still see through the players better. And that's where the trail should be. And that's why when you're at the trail and any position for that matter, you're allowed one or two steps above or below your home position. Your home position is at about the 28 foot mark, which is that white line there, roughly. If you stay within that area, for the most part, you're going to get a good angle. So don't come all the way down just because the ball came down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yes, I am a little perturbed that the center has, hasn't moved this whole time. Don't get stagnant. As officials, I've done it myself. We get stagnant, right? There's not really much happening in our area. We end up kind of ball watching a little, maybe someone else's area. And then we're flat footed and our feet are stuck in the cement. And that's how we blow knees out and pull hamstrings and, and calves. And because all of a sudden the ball goes the other way and we've got to go from a stationary sedentary position into running down the court. If we're constantly moving, maybe knees bent back and forth, one step this way, one step that way, maybe just swaying back and forth you're going to be a much more fluid motion of your 
physical body. So when it does go the other way, your body's ready for it and not just, and it looks bad when you just stand there. So. Are there times when that official w should go more to the baseline? The trail or the center? The center. Um, no, I'm sorry, the, the trail. The trail. Um, I would know. The only time you're going to come that far down to where maybe the center is, is when you're closing down, getting ready for a rotation. And that's because all these players are here and you got to see through all these players. You have your primary coverage area. Don't make it harder for yourself by getting out of position to try and see something that the lead is already watching or that the center is already watching. If you're moving down to see through players into, you know, a lane, maybe then then you're out of position and someone else is already watching that or they should be watching that. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. You know, the whole reason we have primary coverage areas and home positions to, to watch play is because your partner's over there, your partner's over there. They're seeing what they're seeing at the angle that they have. You have the angle that you have. Uh, don't ruin your angle. So now your angle is the same as his angle, right? Now you've got two guys with the same angle. You're going to see the same thing. Then you're going to miss something. So stay in your area, stay in your position and watch what you're supposed to watch. And yeah, we're still going to miss things. We always miss things, right? But you're going to miss way a lot less. This is a pet peeve of mine. This should never happen. Never. <laughs> what is it? Let's watch. Okay, foul. Reports the foul. First of all, he's just short of the foul reporting area. You know, I'm not going to split hairs. That's pretty close. All right? But get to the foul reporting area. First of all, there's no reason we shouldn't get to the foul reporting area. This is something we can completely control because there's no action going on whatsoever. Right? Everyone's waiting for us to do our thing, go all the way into the foul reporting area. But I'm going to give this guy credit. It's pretty close. But what is he doing? He's blocked. He's reporting through an, a player. Do we know? And look, he's even kind of reaching over. See how he's bending to the side? Because he knows he's got to be seen. Just either wait for the player to walk by or move even further into the reporting area. You're going to be rotating table side anyway. You might as well go a little closer and go just beyond. Never report through a player. You shouldn't have to distort your body. There, now he waits and then he reports and maybe even comes in a little bit more. We should never distort our body, move around the player, move around a coach, you know, have to yell extra loud because we're so far away. That's a big pet peeve of mine because there's no reason whatsoever that that should happen right? The play isn't happening so fast and I just want to be on top of it. Play stopped. We know where we're supposed to go. Don't get, and, and most of the time it's laziness because we want to report from the end line and save steps. And, and I get that we all do it sometimes, but it looks bad. So anything to add on that? I didn't think so. I did such a great job explaining that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do we see on this one? Tell me. Ball stays alive. I'm going to play it fast again. Did you see anything happen that we should talk about? Ball stays alive. Watch the lead. I'm going to play it slow. Watch the lead. Where's the lead going? Right? Trust your partners. Now, I get it. First of all, this is a state final game. And the lead's probably all amped up. And I get that, right? Sometimes we, we're really into it. We want to make sure. And he thinks the ball is going to go the other way. And so he doesn't want to get beat. And I can appreciate that. But where are all the players when that happens? There are two players that are almost on the end line. Who's watching those players? What about the, the players at the uh, just below the free throw line? 
If the ball does go the other way, who's going to be on top of that? Your partners, right? Your partners are right there. They're going to be down the court and be watching that play more than the lead. So as lead, don't get so excited, even if it's going to, even if it is a steal and it's going to go the other way. If you get so excited and want to run down, and then now you're ahead of the players and you're going to, you know, beat your partner down even, let your partners work their area. And if it transitions, your partners have got the bulk of the front. You've got as lead becoming the new trail, you've got cleanup. You're behind everyone else. You want to make sure no one throws a punch or an elbow because they got frustrated on that steal. Don't worry about out of your area and getting down and making sure you're not beat. All right. Everyone understands what I'm saying on that one, right? And I, we've all probably done it where, you know, we don't want to get beat, but it looks bad. At least it sticks out like a sore thumb. All right, how about this one? They'll come out and get Taylor to lose it. Game game. Now try to stay away from the foul, but he can't do it. I'm going to play it again fast. What do we see that could possibly want to talk about? They'll come out and get Taylor to lose it. Now try to stay away from the foul, but he can't do it. Anyone have an idea? Probably the leads call because the other the trail was too far back. Maybe the lead, maybe the center, not the trail. Yeah. Now I get it. When the when the dribbler attacks the basket, you're supposed to stay with the the player all the way. I, I get that. But again, this is still kind of a transition. The player is just not coming over. They go into the lane, and where is the trail? Trail's not even in the front court yet. I know we can't see her. And then she comes into the lane, and who's picking up this action? The lead, right? Lead. The, lead, the lead's got nothing else to look at. You know the lead is seeing it. You know the lead has been watching this coming his way the whole time because he's got nothing else to watch. Was there even a foul? I didn't think so. But wait, Josh, she jumped in the air. As long as he jumps vertical. Vertical. Verticality. Verti that's right, verticality. She jumps straight up. And guess who had, has the best angle to see this? Lead. The lead. lead is looking right at it. It's got the perfect angle looking through the players, knows exactly what happened, has not a call, and the trail – it's Didn't she slap her on the arm earlier? The you know the defender slap her, the ball handler on the arm earlier. I don't know, but the but the trail called a block. Oh, do you see? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't looking at that. And you're right. I mean, sometimes we things happen that we don't see. They reach and whatnot. That's another thing where let's just bring this up. It's another good time to bring it up. Kid reaches, and there's a little bit of contact. The arm onto the body or onto the arm. Did it affect the play? If the player plays through it and can get the shot off, is it worth calling? I know some coaches say it is. Some coaches say that's a foul and that goes to their fifth foul and that's in one extra. But let the play happen. And if some contact happens, yeah, maybe they fouled them because they hit them with contact, but it didn't affect anything. Leeway. We've got to allow some leeway for contact so basketball can be played. Right? All right. Any other comments on that one? If you are so far away, trust your partner to get it. That's basically what I'm saying. It's not your area anymore. Let your partner get it. They're right in front of it. 16, 18 hours. Belleville West has missed its first three shot and his shots have committed. I'm going to play it again fast. The lead had a call. The lead who's just transitioning, look where the lead is now. Table side, right? So the lead just came over, saw rotation was necessary. The center even picked it up and started to rotate out, which is good. Or maybe they were coming out to, to view the play better. And the lead comes up with something in the middle of the lane. Do you see the two players at the top of the key? One's starting to come through. The other one's kind of kind of his arms on them. 
You see that? Watch that play as it comes down. Belleville West has missed its first and his. shot. And his shots are committed. All right, now whose area is that? That's the C's. That's the, the C. Now, I'm going to say this is the trail because he's for the most part rotated over now, right? But the old center, new trail, even if it was still the center's uh, the, if even if that official was still the center, what is the center watching? What is the new trail watching? Watching the ball, right? The ball. C's got to pick that up. Needs to watch the ball. So now, what is what is everyone else watching? The center is watching his area, right? Now he doesn't have much to watch in his area, does he? His primary focus is going to be the players in his area, but his secondary focus needs to be that play. And why does it? His, why does the secondary focus need to be that play? I've already said it. It's the only matchup that's going on outside of the the trail, and then the one that's in the in the lane there, right? Yeah, trail's watching the ball. All right, and then the lead has got all this area here, which is basically nobody. These two guys, which is all right. He's 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 focused on them. Something happens, but he can extend beyond and see the players beyond because he's already looking that way, right? So the lead is already kind of seeing what's going on here. The lead is on top of it, seeing there's not much on his area, but wait a second. Oh, now we see some action. The trail, there's no way the trail should get this call. No way, because the trail has to focus on the ball. We all agree with that, right? When the ball is in your primary area, you are watching the ball or that matchup with the ball. The center should still be aware of the, that play because it was really the only uh, matchup that was happening. But the lead also who was looking through can continue with that play. So in this clip, completely acceptable and a really good get, in my opinion, by the lead to get this. And this area in the paint, the area in the paint is really kind of a catch-all area. The trail can get it. The lead can get it. The center can get it. Not all at the same exact time. It depends where the ball is. It depends where the matchups are. But every one of those officials at some point could be looking in that paint area, whether it's a secondary or a primary focus. So knowing, again, what your – fellow officials are watching, knowing that my trail is watching that play. So I got to be focused here is going to help you when things like that do happen, because we don't want to say, Oh, well that happened in the, that happened in the trails area. So I'm not going to get that. I don't want to overstep my bounds. I don't want to reach out of my area, which we don't want to reach out of our area. But when we know that our partner's not watching it, then we do have to reach out of our area. Right? So know when to reach out, when to, to get out of your area in order to, save the crew. Not that that was a crew saver, so to speak, but it was a foul. I had to get it. So I thought that was a good one. Josh, this is yep. Ken. It, it sounds like, or it looked like the players were spot in the middle of the three zones. <laughs> right. Right. You know? where, the, where they all cross over. Right. So it, it, as long as someone does get the call of any of the three officials, as far as I'm concerned, is better than not getting the call. I agree, Ken. Almost any one of the officials could have gotten that. And to be honest, if the trail had seen it in their peripheral, mm -hmm. he could have gotten it. Probably wasn't watching the ball very closely if he did, but um, it was good. The lead got it. And if the lead didn't get it, maybe the center would have come in and got it. I don't know. But uh, they got the play, right? You're And you're right. Ken, it's right where they all intersect. So, and that's why I talk about in that lane. Yes, it's straight down the lane and it's across the free throw where they all kind of have that triple coverage. But that whole lane really is everybody's area at some point, particular of where the ball is. I don't want you to say, go home and say, well, Josh said everyone can call in a lane. <laughs> it's not exactly what I'm saying, but. 
we should all be aware because where is most of the illegal action happening when there's drives to the bucket in the lane, right? Cause that's the only path to get to the basket. So, all right. I got a few more. All right. This is, um, <laughs> I think I put this on Facebook for those of you who are on Facebook. I've got an, this is an honest question. I'm going to play it out with the little text that I put in there, but I truly, there's no, um, well, let me just play it. It's a jump ball situation. And did you see all what the official did? I'm going to play it again. He comes in and he points. Okay. Blue's going to go this way. The other way. White's going to go that way. And then he puts it up, which by the way, and I'm a big jump ball guy, really great toss straight up just beyond where they can jump. That's beautiful. That is a beautiful, beautiful toss. But why are we pointing? Does anybody on here do that? I mean, it's not necessarily wrong, but why do you say blues this way, whites this way? This is varsity basketball. If they don't know which way they're going, shame on them. I shouldn't have to tell them they're shooting at that basket. Right now, again, maybe that's, I don't want to say it's petty, but, but it's not my job to tell them which basket they're going to. They're standing there. It's my job to make sure they're standing in the right spot, right? They should be facing um, the bucket that they're going to, but I shouldn't have to point. And if that's what you do, it's okay if you want to do it, but I don't think there's any reason to do it. So anybody else yeah. here do that? Gosh, this is Dennis. Yeah. Is it, wouldn't you consider that preventive officiating? Just to make sure. You mean just to make sure? No, I don't. <laughs> well, you know. I, I will I've say all, this. In a junior I've high game, Dennis, in a junior high game, yeah, maybe you need to help him out. In a freshman, sophomore game, yeah, maybe it helps him out. But really at the varsity level, yeah, you're right. It, it is preventative. It's helping them out, I suppose. But – they're supposed to know that. I don't know. To, the they coaches don't have... are supposed to know all the rules too, and they don't. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. I'm not saying it's wrong if you're doing it. That's, that's not my point. My point is there's, we do a lot of things as, as officials that we don't need to do, like blowing our whistle at the end of the period. Why are we doing that? The horn signifies in the period. We don't have to blow our whistle unless – the ball is close and it's going to go in and it's not going to go in and we have to blow our whistle to make sure everyone knows that we're waving it off or we're counting it. Yeah. That's why we, what do we, why do we blow our whistle on a foul or a violation? Who can tell me that? Why do we blow our whistle beyond stopping the clock? It's to make sure everyone looks at you. You blew your whistle. Okay. What do you got? If I just, Hey, signal, nobody's watching me right? We have to draw attention to ourselves. So the whistle at the end of the game is the same reason. Use it to draw attention to yourself if you have to give a signal. I don't know. I just went on a tangent, I realized, but a lot of things we do that we don't necessarily need to do. So if you want to keep doing it, it's, it's okay. All right. Let me see. Let me play a few more. Watch your head, by the way. I mean, Terrence Hargrove Jr. is way above the rim. They front the post again and get Another caught. double whistle. No weak side help. Double whistle. Got to make sure that your primetime players stay out of foul trouble. What do you think I'm going to talk about this? I'm going to play it again. Watch your head. What do you think is worth I mean, discussing on this play? Jr. is way above the rim. They front the post again and get caught. No weak side help. Got to make sure that your primetime players stay out of foul trouble. Center's call. Where did the foul happen? Center. We got, a we got a double whistle. Now I'm going to go back again real quick. Again, I, and I've said this multiple times, I'm okay with the double whistle. I think it's okay to have two officials blow as long as it's not, you know, in the corner and, and two officials are calling it. When it's in those border areas, I'm okay with the double whistle. But what do we need to do when we have a double whistle? What do we need to know? Give it to the primary. So the lead is pointing to the trail, which I guess is okay. He points again, which I don't know why he pointed again. 
and he still has his fist up. If you're pointing to your fellow official to take the call, why do you keep your fist up? You don't need to. That's my point. You've just given it up. You've pointed to your partner and, and your partner, I don't stop. And your partner made the call, made the signal. So you know that it's already been taken. So put your fist down. That's a pet peeve of mine for those that know me too. I hate people that hold their fist up uh, when not when it's not needed. But know what your primary area is. And in this situation, the lead gave it up. It wasn't his to give up, but the lead gave it up to the center, which is good, fine. You can point once, the center takes it, and you move on. Now let's look at the coverage. The ball is in the leads area right now, right? I mean, I know it's technically in the trail, but the matchup's for the most part in the lead. Then the ball gets passed over, and now the ball is in where? Center. All the way to the center's area. So the center's picked it up. This isn't a drive to the basket where the lead stays with the player all the way. This is a pass. So the center is going to pick this up. Where should the lead be watching? Off ball. Now I realize there's not much going on here. It's kind of um, unexciting. But that's the lead's primary. The center has the, the play. So there really should only be one whistle. Now again, I'm okay with two whistles. Hey, I don't like the. I don't like Josh. I don't like the double whistle on that play. I think that that lead should, unless that unless that center does not call that foul, he should not have a whistle on that play. That's just my opinion. I agree that the lead shouldn't have had a whistle on that. I agree, but let's at least give some credit where credit is due, Tim. There was a whistle, and he was smart enough to know. Well, maybe he just. Maybe it was dumb luck, but he was smart enough to know that is the center's primary. Let the center take it. No, that's great. That's good. He passed it. He, he said, you take it because otherwise you're, otherwise you're stealing fouls. Well, that's exactly right. Otherwise, right. otherwise you're taking someone else's foul or that's right. you have a foul and you're giving it up. And I hate that too. If it's your foul, don't let me take it. It's your foul. You take it. All right. All right. So right now, what do we have? As you can see, <laughs> we got two trails. Now, again, I don't know if one guy's being lazy. If one guy doesn't know where he's supposed to, I don't know what the reason is, but those two officials now have the same look. Yeah. They're each on a different side of the court, but the angle that they see into the into the lane and in through the players is the same. There's no advantage to having three guys on this game. All right, so now if the lead rotates over, which is good. But wait a second. He just rotated over and he still didn't. That we so these guys want to both be trail, I guess. <laughs> The ball's all the way out here, and I get it. If the ball's out here, you don't want to be, you know, stacked. But he should be down to the free throw line extended before that ball even gets over there. And then you can move up if you need to move up a little. So be aware of where your partners are. Doesn't mean watch your partners, but be aware of where your partners are and get to your spot. This whole play, the, the lead rotated twice, and the other two guys basically did nothing. That's not lazy. That's just not understanding. Well, maybe it is lazy. I don't know. But that's not understanding where you need to be. The whole point of a three-person uh, crew is, again, to have different angles, as I've said. You're looking here, looking here. So if the lead comes over, you need to now have a different angle from the lead or the trail. And the trail is going to move up. So we can constantly have that triangle looking in through different areas. So know where you're supposed to stand and when you're supposed to stand there. How about last second shot?
Again, this is a pet peeve of mine. Last second shot. Why is he taking it? Can you? Yeah, that's a great question. Why is he taking it? Who could tell me in a last second shot scenario, who takes, who takes it? Who calls the last second shot? Who gets to call whether it's good or no good? Be, if it's at C is opposite of table side, they should take it. Opposite table. Opposite, well, opposite table. table. So if oh. you've got lead and trail opposite of table, who takes it? Should be the trail. Then. The trail. <laughs> it's never going to be the lead. Never. 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 Uh, we never say never, never say always. There may right. be a situation where we need help. But even if we need help, the lead isn't going to say, I got it. I got it. I got it. You're going to say, Hey lead, can you help me? And then the lead will help you. It's always going to be either the trail or the center. And it's always going to be the official that is opposite of the table. All right. So with that said, let's watch this again. <sighs> Who signals? Trail. The trail signaled. In the wrong the side trail, of the court. Down the table the side. It, now, it was an easy call. I get it. But the trail should not be. The, the table side official shouldn't be making it. Even if you see it. Even if you're the only one who saw it. Wait to be asked. It should always be opposite table. Now, Josh. Yeah. Um, up in Wisconsin, we got a wacky gym where the score clock, the, the court was moved during the renovation. And we actually have a, a, a court where the trail would take a table side because it's opposite side of the where the court used to be. You follow what I'm saying? So, but pre-game, we always say, hey, the clock's in the wrong spot, so the trail better take that because okay. they're looking that way. Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's a big misnomer. Where the clock is positioned has absolutely no bearing as to who should be taking the last second shot. Because when the, when the, when the horn goes off, are you watching the clock? No. Even if it's in your eye view and it's kind of the way you're looking, are you watching the clock? No. no. I hope not. Cause then you missed right. to see if the ball left his hands in the proper time. Right. Correct. So we are going by sound and sound if, in sight. And if for some reason you have an illuminated light around the rim, we can go by the light. But the horn sounds it. And someone said to me once, but what if, what if it gets to all zeros, you know, like triple zeros and there's no horn? Well, if that happens, then we'll deal okay. with it. Right. Right. And that's why as varsity officials, if you're there at least at halftime before the game, before it, you can see if there's any weird things that happen with the clock. And if that is the case, you see that the horn's not going off, then you can talk about how you want to handle that. But for the most right. part, okay. as long as the horn is sounding, go by the horn. Don't worry about what the clock shows. And how many have worked with a clock that doesn't have tenths of a second? Yeah. All so of if there isn't tenths of a second on the clock, is it possible to have all zeros showing and yet still have time that hasn't run off the clock yet? Yes. Right? Tenths of a second. If it's not showing, it'll show zero but yet you still got tenths of a second. So it's very possible to have a clock stopped with all zeros and no horn. So my point is to what you said, Bob, don't worry about where the clock right. is. Right. Hey, thank and you. Don't, and don't let anyone tell you, well, this is the way we're going to do it because the clock's here and, and who's ever fit. Okay. You want to look at the clock? Fine. Then I'll just take all the last second shots because I'm going to watch to see if he gets the ball off in time. Right. Right. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. All right. One more video, and then I got to let you guys go. As much as I love doing this. Okay, what happened? The ball Threw the ball to nobody. Oh, wrong. He threw the ball to nobody, and it went out of bounds. 
And this official comes in and says, no, it's down at the end line. Is that right? The ball went out on the sideline. No one touched it. Right, but the ball went out there. But I don't know who said that. It sounded like Bob. Yeah, if the no. ball goes out of bounds and doesn't touch anybody, like it does here, didn't touch anybody, the rule says, since it's a throw-in violation, it goes back to the original throw-in spot. Right? Now, right. as you could see, the official threw it to go where it went out of bounds. He didn't know. And I'm not going to fault him for that. But somebody on that crew, and the trail knew, somebody on that crew has got to know the ball doesn't go into bounds there. And get it right. Because you've got three people. Why just, oh, well, okay, we'll take it here, right? That's lazy. If you do it in a game where it's 40 to two, I get it, right? You just want to get the game moving. But now you are setting yourself up in a habit of just doing what is easy. It's not what's easy because in a game where it comes down to two points, it might make a big difference to take the ball on the end line as opposed to the sideline. But if you're not used to it and you just normally, oh, okay, go here, then you're not even going to think that it is a thing. So every game, no matter what it is, just do it right. And then you build that habit. So you're always going to do it right. This is the cycle end of our meetings for 20, 2021. All right, 2020 to 2021. I've got a new schedule already set up. I'm going to put it up. I'll email it out to everybody. It's still going to be Thursdays for the most part, I think until the, maybe the last week again. It is the third Thursday of every month. So it's nice and easy to remember. Nobody has to think, oh, wait, which Thursday is it? It's always the third Thursday of every month. It's always going to be seven o'clock. I'm going to have different topics again. Um, which we can always go off topic if people have questions, but that's going to come out um, sometime in June. I got to get through clinic season. So, all right, well, again, thanks for coming. Hopefully that helped. It wasn't too boring and mechanics, you know, you can get stuck on mechanics and we just tried to change it up as much as I could get different views on things, but um, hopefully we'll see you in a couple months when we start up again and have a good summer guys. Thanks, Josh. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh, appreciate you. Thanks, Josh. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you in June.